On this episode of Star Trek Universe, we are talking about Lower Decks 401, 2 Vix, and 402. I have no bones, yet I must flee. Right after these, <laughs> these words from our mystery sponsors. Welcome to Star Trek Universe, the podcast where you get to listen in on two lifelong friends do what they always do, chat about Star Trek. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. Hey, buddy. Hey, man. It's been a while. Yeah, for sure. I had that little break in uh, content, and I uh, tried to take take the time to get some uh, other stuff, fo- focus on some other things, and uh, di- didn't get nearly enough done. Uh, in the last month, uh, as always, uh, you know, I wake up every day, have a to-do list, go to sleep, looks the same. It's no good. This is a yeah. This ADHD life is no way to live, <laughs> <laughs> or that, uh, at least no way to accomplish anything. <laughs> like that frog and toad book, man. See, so, yeah, I never read it. I was I was too ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> ah, one of them makes a list of things to do, and then somewhere in the middle of it, like a stiff breeze or something, blows the list away, and. They were like, oh, no, what am I going to do? And they're like, oh, you're just going to live your life. And mm. Yeah, that is get nothing done. Unfortunately, <laughs> my, list is, my list is in the cloud. My list cannot be blown away. So I keep toiling at my best laid plans. No good. <laughs> yeah. And like today, I feel like I am like, my wife is still asleep. <laughs> I didn't want to turn on the show in the living room because it would wake her up. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I tried to watch it on my computer, but there was some kind of like weird update that was making Paramount Plus make a noise in my headphones. Oh, no. And I couldn't get it to work. I was like, usually that kind of stuff happens when there's going to be an update. And I was like, ah, I don't have time to wait for it to tell me. So I tried to update it, and then I just wound up leaving and watching it on my phone. Mm. I feel, and like I'm watching Boimler and going, yep, I feel like this is this is my life. <laughs> 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 it's like no matter what he does, there's something there going. Nope. <laughs> yeah. L- lack of confidence, Boims. <laughs> um. Well. Yeah, that's it. What What did uh, What did you think of uh of the two t- two, from two two episodes? I guess we can start with one and yeah, uh, two Vix. The episode two Vix. It's good. Good to see the old crew back uh, and uh and combined. Yeah. I uh, <laughs> I loved the premise. I loved the that someone figured out how to weaponize the two Vix phenomenon. Yeah, that's pretty great. Um, I also loved that. Um, I loved how much shade they threw at Voyager, but lovingly. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, I don't even know if it was shade. I, I I feel like they were. And I'm it not seems saying... like a kooky Voyager solution, <laughs> right? Well, I didn't think it was shade. It was sort of like highlighting. The like, uh, something about Voyager that I've never really. See, I don't. I don't think of Voyager that way. But once they said it, like, yeah, it, it's kind. Of, I, I, it almost was like it was lovingly saying like, Voyager's a little weirder than a lot of the Treks. Which I don't know if that's really true, but I really like it as a. Uh, I don't know as as a, like. Steer, you know, like people always say, like uh, there's certain things you say about different series. Like this series is uh uh, more overarching. The series is all about uh, all episodic. This series is whatever. It is like mm-hmm. kind of true that Voyager is kind of just weird because it's often that other gal or you know other part of the quadrant, quadrant. other quadrant, and like it's yeah. uh, you know they they encounter a lot of weird things. They do just different kinds of adventures um, and have weird solutions to things. Like uh, yeah, I really liked the uh, the cheese solution at the end. I really liked that they got their own little museum installation. That uh, was really fun. Yeah, I loved the uh, the little robotic uh, salamanders of, of oh so funny Tom Paris and Janeway. Yes, and I my favorite thing about that was when they went to the bridge and they're all fighting, and the salamander it was just sitting in Janeway's chair. Uh huh. <laughs> as if like it had some sort of like memory for some reason that it was Janeway, even though it was just a little robotic salamander uh-huh. you know like it had like a like a some sort of cognition that it was Janeway and it didn't even get involved it just sat like on the edge of the chair watching the fights happen around it it was really funny yeah yeah that was good I yeah I I enjoyed it I enjoyed the episode um 
<laughs> I I don't know that I have a whole lot to say about it other than it was I loved that Tandy took up the Janeway straight up murdered Tuvix <laughs> position <laughs> and oh, so yeah. did the so did the captain. Yeah, like, like everyone. I honestly the, the one thing that disappointed me about that is this episode is the idea that like I thought they were gonna sort of in a comical way really examine uh, the issue in I thought of two two different ways. Like I thought maybe they'll come up with a different solution and like throw really throw shade on Janeway, <laughs> uh-huh. or which they kind of talked about. They're like we'll go to uh, Star- we and they they didn't, they didn't blame Janeway. They're like we go to Starfleet Medical. We're we're, we're not in the, stuck in the Delta Quadrant. We don't have to make such a hard decision, right? Um, which which was which was nice. I, I liked that, and it sort of like gave them a way out without. Without blaming Janeway too much, because it was a hard decision. Yeah. Um, but then also, um, <laughs> it, it, what I thought would, would would have been interesting is if they had to make the same decision for some reason, you know, like like, and then they sort of like connected to the idea that, like oh, that really was a hard decision. Like we all yell about her killing Tuvix, but then it's like, oh, but. It had to be like it was that, or yeah. her two friends died, and then you sort of like right. highlighting it, and then them having to make the same decision, which is kind of what happened. But they they let them get off the hook by making it a big uh, non sentient meatball, as they say. <laughs> yeah, a Cronenberg monster. Yeah, yeah, exactly, a classic Rick and Morty Cronenberg monster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I think my favorite part of that episode is when Shax comes in. And he's like, "Have you figured out a solution?" He's like. Yeah, Janeway killed him. She murdered him. Mm-hmm. He was like, what? And she, and she goes, he pled for his life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I loved how they played with that idea by uh, having, I forget I forget the new life form's name. Do you remember? Yeah, I, there were a whole bunch of them. I, I know, know, just the first one. Anyway, um Skrillex or something. I don't know. Skrillex. <laughs> yeah, DJ Skrillex. That's it. Um, <laughs> but no, um, it's a Hynix or something like that. Um, anyway, I loved it. Uh, as soon as he was born, he was like, I don't know who I am, but I love life. <laughs> And they even had uh, <laughs> him create his own solution. Like, he modified yep. the tricorder using the knowledge of both sides of his brain. He modified the tricorder to be able to, like, uh, sense emotions, which is, like, a whole thing. They did not explore, but they basically made it clear that he was a beautiful creature with his own uh, capabilities uh-huh. that were valuable. <laughs> But they sidestepped the problem because he he was totally responsible for what he what happened to him, like by like taking Meagly Moo and then like right he became a villain raising an army yeah 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 which is it's funny because like we talk about the Janeway solution and really like as much as we talk about that I never really have a problem with it. it's funny to say how she killed Tuvix it's funny but like the truth is that is one of the boldest episodes. Because the writers don't give themselves a way out. So while uh, we joke about Janeway not making a better decision and how she Mm -hmm. definitely killed Tuvix, and it's true, that episode sets it up so that she has a really fucking hard decision to make. And this episode did the thing where that right, if you think about it in a meta sense, the writers took the easy way out in this one. Whereas we think about Janeway's decision, it's really the writer's decision. They could have gone down a road that was like, actually made this one hard as well. Um, But instead they were like, "Uh, now let's just make Tuvix a villain. And then as Tuvix is a villain, you know, then there's no problem killing him. Even even if he had like not turned into a meatball monster, if Tubix by making him villainous at that moment, like it really made the whole decision easier. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to give them a pass necessarily, but I mean, I'm not looking to you know destroy them or anything because I enjoy the show quite a oh, bit. Oh yeah, for sure. But um, well, it's not. I don't just know. not I, it's just not that show. You know, like it's not trying yeah. to be that. I'm not. I'm not blaming the show for not giving us an amazing moral conundrum of an episode because that's just not what Lower Decks really does. Yeah, but at the same time, you know, I kind of feel like just by virtue of bringing it up. They did their job. They did. I mean, they did their job. 
acknowledging the inherent problematic nature of that episode. You know, I don't think I would I would even describe the the original Voyager episode two Vix as problematic. Like, it did exactly what it set out to do. It yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I totally a agree. Horrendous moral quandary. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, you know, emotions get in the way, but you're like. Okay, let's go the Vulcan route. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, or the one. So you save Tuvok and Neelix, and you kill Tuvix. Sorry, yeah, guy. yeah. But it, it it's such a like I as much as I give Voyager shit, and a lot of people give that episode particularly shit. I I don't because I think that's actually one of the more bold episodes, yeah. and more interesting episodes they've ever done because they not only like decide to make they, they they don't make the decision easy on Janeway. They make her right, really yeah. make a decision. Then they let Tuvix plead for his life. And like that is such a instead of Tuvix, it's there's so many ways you have outs as a writer in that episode to be like, Tuvix is bad. Tuvix did a mm-hmm. horrible thing. Or Tuvix realizes that he'd like to give his life for the two friends. Or like whatever. Right. But the fact that they like fully like double down on Tuvix wants to live is such a bold decision. So like yeah. in, in that way, I'm glad this episode highlighted this because like we haven't really talked about it on this show, but like I think that's a great episode. Like I think it is a fantastic episode. Yeah, yeah. Like even though, yeah, Janeway definitely killed Tuvix, but she saved her two friends, and that moral decision is not an easy one and it's as much as we make fun of it or like in the in the you know community joke about it uh like it's uh it's like a great episode (laughs) the the real travesty is that tuvix was a more interesting character than either tuvok or neelix yeah now that's a whole different uh like bugaboo to discuss like the idea that like oh well as a watcher of the show i just wanted it to happen like this would have been better and more interesting if like they just accepted this new life form which i do think is very valid um and could have been a very interesting way to answer the question like and man yeah honestly thinking about it as much as i like how bold that ending is and him pleading for his life and then doing it anyway like it's terrible but it's it's also interesting and 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 tough the idea as as from a writing perspective, like I just really like the idea of her deciding to stick with the morals, doing the thing, like letting him live, and then having to deal with the like shadows of her best friends, like walking around the ship, doing things that are sort of Tuvok like and sort of Neelix like, mm-hmm. and like living as Tuvix and having to face the fact that she made the decision to let that happen, like that. It, it, that would have been a. It would definitely would have been an interesting way to go as well. Yeah. And of course, you know, even as a kid, I was sitting there going like, "Why can't they just play with the transporter a little bit and figure out a way to bring to to you know do have both?" Like, yeah. They keep the gem- a, co- a, do- a copy of the genetic matter. Yeah. Well, that's that's the whole thing with with transporters. That's always an issue. Like I always think that is like, can't you just copy someone twice? Like you do. They do it all the time by mistake. Yeah. Oh, well, they've done it a few times by mistake. Not all the time. Um, yeah. But, you know, Boimler's had it happen. Uh, <laughs> no, nah, I don't remember what happened with Boimler. How did Boimler get doubled? Did they just say it was a Riker scenario? Because it was while he was on the Titan, right? Uh, I can't. Yeah, I think it was either a Riker scenario or a Enemy Within. But I, it, would ha- it would have had to have been a Riker scenario. Because other if it had been the that or from the enemy within with when Kurt got split, he would have had an evil version and a good version. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm pretty sure it was. And it was while he was under Riker's command. I think that, I think <laughs> yeah. if I remember correctly, I think they just did it off screen and said like it had happened to him. I got, I got Riker cloned or whatever. Maybe not. No, no, it was a whole episode. Wasn't it? I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I can't remember. I can't remember, but I'd love that that Boimler's still out there. I really love that. That Boimler's still out there. Like, didn't he die? Wait, did he? I thought he did. I didn't think so. Yeah, look that look that up on the old let's look the, uh, the trusty Googs. Uh, uh, what's it called? What do they call the uh, Star Trek wiki that everybody uses? <laughs> there's 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 a there's a Star Trek wiki. Memory there. memory alpha. That's memory it. Alpha. That's it. Thank you. Um, All right. <clears throat> hold on. I I think he's still alive, if I remember correctly, and he was he seemed to be doing better. Oh, 
He's officially deceased, but I guess he might be a part of like Section Thirty One. Oh something. yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I, I totally forgot about the Section Thirty One thing. Yeah, he dies, and they like th- they think he's dead. It's sad, but then it, as a post credit sequence, I think like they <clears> pop up <throat> and mm-hmm. uh, he's getting resurrected by Section Thirty One, or like he faked his death to join Section Thirty One, which is such a cool thing. I can't wait to see. Section 31 Boimler versus real Boimler. Like, it's going to be so good. <laughs> yeah. I want to see a, I want to see a Strange New Worlds where uh, William Boimler winds up in the past to do something awful mm-hmm. for Section 31. They're like, you're not Boimler? And he's like, oh, no, I am. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like the, yeah, ba- ba- uh, I call him Bad Boimler here, but I'm not. I don't mean it. I think I think it'll be interesting. I here's the one thing about this show. I love all the stuff they're doing and all the like world building they're building. But this episode with the um, uh, Tuvix is <laughs> Tuvi. Uh, <laughs> I feel like it highlights a f- a thing about this show that. I wish was different. And this is not saying it's bad. It's just something I would rather have out of this show. And it's something I often would rather have out of the show, which is taking the episodes like 10% more seriously. Like, yeah. like I'd really like it if these were as funny, like as tonally irreverent and like, all of that, but then still set up the moral quandary, and they weren't always yeah. just like a chase around the room kind of situation at the end, which is always fun, and I laugh, and I do think it might undercut the comedy a little bit, and it takes a master to be able to pull off the tone where you can like really get hit in the feels slash the uh, uh, ethical like conundrum bone, uh, yeah. but then also laugh like there's only a few directors i feel like that really do that well and it's like edgar wright and james gunn like that's like that's like the two that i think do that incredibly well um joss whedon uh, at times in in in, in buffy like i'm hitting the feels and then i laugh really hard like there's just not that many shows i feel like they can really strike that tone but but yeah i I actually i think joss whedon's even a bad example because like while his stuff is funny, I don't think it's it doesn't hit the same funny levels as like Edgar Wright or uh, it James doesn't Gunn. hit the same funny levels or hit the same serious levels a lot of times that I feel like they could. Sure, sure, but I, but also um, it's, it's a little unfair because most of what Whedon has done is like episodic television. So I'm trying to think of like uh, I'm trying to compare these these directors, and it's a little a little, little hard to do. We're talking about a TV show, but you know, it, with with the, the style of Lower Decks, and especially considering that Mike McMahon was used to work on Rick and Morty, I'm thinking Rick and Morty because Rick and Morty oh, actually yeah. does a really good job of being super serious and like destroying your soul. You're a hundred percent right. You're a hundred percent right. That's a really good, uh, a much better analog than, and it's such an obvious one. I don't know why I went didn't go there. I just was trying to think of directors that do that really well. Um, but I, but I. Dan Harmon is a great example yeah. of a writer who can do that. And like, yeah, I, I think that Lower Decks, and I don't think it's, I think it's a choice. And that's what kind of bothers me. I don't think it's, they're incapable of it. Because clearly they, when they talk about Tuvix, they know how an episode of Star Trek functions. And they know like what they are doing when they make this version of the hybrid a villain. You know, they know they're giving yeah. themselves outs. Um, and I just kind of wish they wouldn't. I wish they'd go all out with the comedy, but also like hit me in the like, ooh, ooh, Boimler made that decision. Damn. Like, I would love it if like, you know, Tendi had to make a decision to like, kill this hybrid and it wasn't a clear cut decision, you know, like it, it, it that way and that like weighs on her, but it's, <laughs> it, it's hard to do that and keep the tone. And I get how that's difficult, but Rick and Morty is a perfect example of how that's possible. Yeah. If they went Rick and Morty way, I think it would be very easy to wind up deconstructing Star Trek to a point that it wasn't enjoyable anymore for anyone. Like, um, I, I think you're right. And I think where that, problem lies is hope and the thing about rick and morty it's really hard to look the face of the real ethical and moral dilemmas of this universe multiverse and like 
stare at it in the face, laugh, and still be a hopeful character and still be mm-hmm. Starfleet. You know what I mean? Like Rick, yeah. and, Rick is not Starfleet. You know, <laughs> he's the furthest from Starfleet you can get. And that's why he's able, it, there's a cynicism to that show that I think would almost be necessary. If you're laughing in the face of Tuvix dying, you're abandoning Star Trek, you know? And, and so I get, yeah. I get the struggle and the difficulty with that. Um, but it still doesn't mean I don't like watch some of these episodes and wish they found a way to thread that needle. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, I do like the idea that the, the first character who got too vixed here were, you know, took the time to look back at what the original solution was and go, Oh Jesus. No. Nope. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. like, Became a villain essentially because of that. Like, yeah, it's true. Tuvix is his origin story. Like, it, it's his, it's his like par- Batman's parents dying or whatever, you know. Like, and 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 in that case, like Janeway is his Joe Chill or whatever. Like, it's it's kind of great. Yeah, and when you when you look at like the fact that Janeway killed Tuvix to, in favor of her friends, and that was the big deciding factor. That's why he's like, I need friends. Mm. Like he's he's got to create new version, new two vixes, so that there will be more people who agree with him. The thing that I liked is they continued to call themselves two vixes. I forget the actual line. There's a line once he's creating a bunch of them, and he says something, or he says something about two vix, like calling them. We need more two vix, yeah, or something like that. And it's kind of neat because it's like. Tuvix has become this symbol to them of like yeah. this. So I, I do love that. I I, I I love this episode. It's great. It's great for what Lower Decks is. I just uh, I always have that sort of like in the back of my head that idea. I wanted I wanted more with the combination of whoever in that whale. That was funny. <laughs> I want fish. <laughs> I want fish. That would have been a really good callback in the middle of a battle or whatever. <laughs> yeah. That's the other thing about like this being the way they structured it. Um, we didn't get much time to know like what it means for those two characters to be combined. Like what mm-hmm. what what are the essential parts of those characters that would have lived on? Like all that stuff's interesting. And when you start combining a bunch of other characters, it would have been nice to like throw in a bunch of little random lines where they're doing things that are sort of riding the line between those two characters or struggling between both sides of themselves or whatever. But like what was the B? There's a B plot going on at the same time. Oh, oh, right. This is the Voyager, it's the Voyager episode. So, like, yeah. that's part of the issue with this episode and part of why it's a, that <laughs> we're talking all about the Tuvix part, which, like, makes sense because I think that's what the episode's focus is on. But, like, this is the Voyager heavy episode where you also have a Borg takeover, like, which we haven't even discussed because the Tuvix part was so much more interesting to us, I guess. <laughs> Oh no, no no! I loved I loved the zaniness of the oh, other me plot too. where it was like that the holdover virus <laughs> accidentally got assimilated. And now it's like oh my god, just everything is sort of just going tits up on Voyager. And they used all the holodeck villains or whatever. Like I loved that the void deep cuts. Yeah, the, whoa, these are void deep cuts. Um, that was pretty great, pretty great. And I loved that one of them was just a completely useless. Uh, to the, to the cause of the Borg, but like just the the like Janeway's lover, like just just yeah. popping in everywhere. It'll, Janeway's like Irish lover or whatever. It's really he's, wonderful. He's just he's like I miss my wife. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as he's dying, he goes, "I have so much love." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was so fantastic. Funny. And it was really nice to see Voyager again, to, to see them, how they recreated everything. and Yeah, all the sets. Yeah. yeah. Astrometrics and all that. Mm. Like, that was cool. Very cool. <clears throat> that was cool. I just, you know, it was not as meaty, I guess. Yeah, I, I don't think it's less meatier than most Lower Decks episodes, but it is... Um, you know, it, 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 yeah, I don't know why that's highlighted. Because I think because Tuvix is such a heavy episode, like this one, it, it, I just I wanted more. But then, like mm-hmm. it, again, what they're really doing here is just a tromp through Voyager, and we got a bunch of different little Voyager Easter eggs. Some of them I do not even recall uh, <laughs> at all. <laughs> I know you did a rewatch more recently, so you probably caught more of the references. I d- 
I I watched the first season and some of season two, and then I got distracted, so I didn't really oh, go for okay. watch either. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, uh, yeah, great. It was, it was really wonderful, wonderful, wonderful little episode. Uh, but let's move on to the second of the two episodes that we didn't know they were dropping to. Um, yeah, yeah. What did you think of that? Uh, that their second episode. Well, I have to say, right out of the gate, I loved the the title so much. Yeah, I have no bones, and I must flee. Yeah, because it's a it's a reference to a Harlan Ellison uh, short story called "I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream." And, ah, uh, very nice. Uh, yeah, that you're you're always going to curry favor with me invoking the name of Ellison. Yes, but uh, <laughs> no, I enjoyed this one, and for. <laughs> the moopsie he, moopsie <laughs> was wonderful <laughs> i i laughed in the trailer when he drank the bones and i laughed again here like every yep. time mm-hmm. it's just it's such a ridiculous premise but I, I enjoyed the hell out of it i love that they were like this guy doesn't have bones he probably let it out and he's like <laughs> And they're like, no, he had plenty of bones. He's like, no, <laughs> I am ossified. <laughs> I forgot that line. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's really, really great. Um, and the, yeah, just a great episode. And the, the I guess, like, um, storyline of the episode being Mariner pushing back on a promotion. Uh, and we know that's been a part of her character, but it's like, it kind of interesting mm-hmm. to see it like in action, I guess. Like she finally got a promotion. And now she immediately wants to go back, you know? Yeah. Which I know we've, she's talked about never wanting to move up, but now it's interesting that ransom is like really turning out to be a really great commander for her, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And I, I'm interested in where their relationship's going. There's also been some, uh, like, allusions to them being a little hot for each other. So there's always that in the back of my head, mm. too. Like, don't you remember that? Nah. Oh, I don't. <laughs> they've, they've, there was, uh, it was the episode where he had to, like, fight to the death for her or something like that. Oh. Right? They were, like, on some planet and he's, it has to take his shirt off and fight. Very, the very Kirk moment or whatever. Gotcha. And she, uh, just sort of like to the side to herself realizes she kind of, she's kind of hot for him. And in the same episode, I think he realizes he's hot for her for some other reason. So ever since that, I've always had this, like, there's a weird overtone to the relationship to me. Um, fair enough. But, uh, so there's that, but then there's also the fact that he's just being a good leader and he like respects her and thinks that she's a good, uh, um, officer and is doing a good job as her commander which i think is not something i expected from him necessarily <laughs> yeah well I, I like i did like that because i felt i feel like it's nice to see competence <laughs> yes <laughs> and we're like okay there's a reason he's a commander cool yeah yeah which i think is fairly ubiquitous through star trek but it's nice that and this is you know it goes back to the conversation we we're having about tuvix so like uh, leaving in place that sort of like vision of this future where uh you have these officers that are really doing their jobs and really care and like sort sort of utopian ideal of Star Trek uh, manifesting in that way is all part of why this show can't be cynical. <laughs> but like, uh-huh. uh it, yeah, it's a, it's such a hard line to walk to be really explore these ideas. And I, I think, I think it's actually something that like a lot of franchises have an issue with right now. Um, and it's why the boys and Rick and Morty are so like wonderful is because they throw away all of the baggage of feeling like you need to honor the thing. You know what I mean? They're literally yeah. being made to dishonor the thing. And, but in doing that, they are able to question ideas of being a superhero or question the ideas of being a sci-fi badass that like Star Trek is, has a really hard time doing um, yeah. because it needs to stay hopeful. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I think that's a, I think it's a problem with a lot of the franchise stuff. I think Marvel has that problem. I think uh, Star Trek, Star Wars, like they all kind of have that problem of 
you know, you need the Jedi to always be good. You need Starfleet to always be good. You need your heroes to, like, walk the line in Marvel or in DC. Um, which, you know, I think um, DC did a little more exploration with that, for sure, lately, than uh, other 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 franchises have they at the wrong time because that's you know Snyder was all about deconstructing exactly yeah. everything and it just didn't pan out yeah, um, yeah yeah no i think well and i think that's a big part of the problem with those like the reason those aren't as successful which kind of sucks because I think in some ways I think that's value that's very valuable. Like I said, I think the boys and Rick and Morty and I'm sure there's some other good examples are doing yeah. that well uh, at this point. But doing it inside the franchise itself, it's like you you don't want to question you don't want to watch the Superman thing and question the need for Superman. You know, like like this it's it's hard to be the thing and question the thing at the same time. Yeah, I mean. I, you know, I've come to think that those those movies may have just—if they had started now—I think it would be a different story. Mm, just possibly, it's but possible. I think they would have been received differently. Yeah, I, yeah. But, I, I wonder because I, I do think a lot of it just has to do with the way we feel about the franchises we love. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. But also, there's a lot of what ifs. Like, what if the studio hadn't com- continually mucked around with all of it and yeah making them change stuff and cut things and right yeah it's 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 a tough one to to come up with that but uh i don't know Uh, yeah i I really enjoyed this episode i i love the the dynamic between mariner and ransom and um what is what is the captain's name uh mariner no no (laughs) Well, that's her daughter's name, right? Yeah. But she has a different yeah. last name. Yeah. I can't remember. I, it's been bothering me all day, and I don't know why. Freeman. Freeman. That's right. That's it. Yeah. Okay. But, um... Oh, there's a, <laughs> there's a line from the Tuvix episode that I just have to throw out that I freaking sure. loved. Bring me more scrumptious senior staff. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's so good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I did. I, th- I think overall I liked this one more because it got into more of Mariner not wanting to be promoted and and her need to be in continued Arrested Development. Yeah. Well, see, and, and it's interesting, and maybe Mariner is kind of the key to this sort of tone we're talking about, because, and I think she is a, a lot of the key to the tone of this show being funny and still being able to be Star Trek, is she is having the same problem that we're talking about uh, in our in our like discussion of franchises right now, uh, because she is also having the problem of be, wanting to be the outsider who questions the thing of Starfleet, yeah. but she also is Starfleet. She is like born of Starfleet. She she's a, yep. a lover of Starfleet, but she also wants to undercut it and question it and be an outsider. And that that inherent struggle in her is I, I think in, interesting that it kind of represents the 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 thing that this episode was about is sort of representative of the conversation we're having but from a completely different uh corner of our brains or whatever but <laughs> is she also representative of the fan base the person who's willing to call out the bullshit of the show and be like why would they do that, that this is bullshit they should right. do this well it, i think that's inherent in this show as well in all the characters they're all elements of the fan base um you know mariner is is definitely one that questions more questions but still loves it you know what i mean interesting i haven't really thought about it this way but i have definitely yeah. thought of them as fans i mean they do it on a strange sure. strange new worlds you know they say they have the whole thing do we sound like them right now because we're talking about the nx01 yeah i feel like boimler is like the fan the part of fandom who just loves everything and doesn't question anything and mariner is the opposite he's like the goofy effusive loves everything thoughtless fan in some ways um but the the interesting thing is he's they don't disrespect him for that like that's not like none of that what i said is meant to be negative um he is just like 
I just love it all. I love it. Give it to me. And Mariner is like, clearly loves it, but almost like she has like a love hate relationship with Starfleet, which very much yeah. mirrors people that I know who love, have love hate relationships with all their franchises. And then, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of like what Tindy and Rutherford would represent. And there's definitely fans of Trek that like get into the sort of uh, minutia, yeah. the minutia of it. And I think, I feel like Rutherford is that like, like loving the ships and loving the, this, like loving all that little stuff that you, Oh yeah. No, building the, DS nine models. And yeah, stuff. exactly. Like that, that's <laughs> the, I feel like that's the Rutherford's, but what, what is Tindy? Like what's her, like she's similar. Um, but I'm, I, this is a, this is just a theory I'm crafting uh, in the moment of like, sure. How they, the four of them represent different parts of the fan base. Um, I feel like Tendy is a little harder to nail down. Maybe, because this theory is bullshit. I don't think it's bullshit. <laughs> well, thanks. Oh, well, I mean, I, I started it, so yeah. why would I think it's bullshit? <laughs> there you go, taking credit for my ideas again, Matt. No, I just meant thanks, because I'm like, <laughs> sitting here trying to flesh it out, and that my exercise is not useless is what I was saying thanks for. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, I don't think you're useless, man. Yes, thanks, thanks, flush Blair. out my idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's been very clear, and we've somehow missed for four seasons. <laughs> uh, there were a couple of different. There was a there was a B and C plot. One with uh, Rutherford trying to get promoted in a day. Yeah, <laughs> I, lo- I love the resolution of that one. I can just ask for things I deserve. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> Which is honestly like a, a great lesson in life and like in, in relationships, but it's also like in just a good work advice thing. Like one thing I really learned in the, the very few jobs I had before I just did my own thing with music was like, just sometimes you just got to go to him and be like, you need to go like every six months and be like, Hey, can I have a race? <laughs> Cause like a lot of times they'll be like, Oh yeah. <laughs> like, like a little, even little like pizza places and stuff I worked at is just like a thing I did. And it like, yeah, they'd be like, Oh yeah, we'll give you 50 cents or whatever. <laughs> like sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um, just, just, just asking for what you think you deserve. And like it, as a, entrepreneur now and doing music and stuff like that's also been a thing like oh i think it's time to raise my prices like i just need to it's like it makes sense and i'm 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 better now i just make more and like i just need to know what i'm worth when i ask for it you know um yeah i I, I, I loved that yeah um but the other plot was um born we're trying to find a place to live yeah (laughs) real silly (laughs) Really, silly. and all he had to do was like adjust the, the controls on the windows. Yeah, which was wonderful because, yeah, I guess you wouldn't know about that if you're used to just putting up with. I've definitely been there. Like I'm used to living with six ro- two six roommates or whatever. So like I don't know to adjust the thermostat. I never wanted to bother anyone before. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I can just make a decision to change this. What? <laughs> yeah. As yeah, when wonderful. when yeah when I uh got my first apartment after I moved out of your apartment. Yeah. I had, I'd never not had a bunch of people living with me or at least one person living with me. And I found that like, I mean, I had a big TV and I got a couch and set up my living room and then just sat in the corner and watched everything with headphones on my computer. Yeah. And I don't think you really changed that for a really long time. <laughs> no. Still, like you, I would always come over and you'd still just be like huddled on your computer with headphones. Very funny. Well, yeah, well, eventually I was like, screw this, I'm not using this space, and then I just turned the living room into a studio space with a giant green screen and all these, like, big industrial lights. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 I remember, um, good stuff. Yeah, uh, but yeah, no, I, I that's, that's a very <laughs> real thing for me, it's like... Like, yeah. I remember when you came, to, you came to look at my new house, uh, the, the new house that I just bought, like, two months ago, and yeah, you, and I, you, I was looking, you were looking around, and I was like... Yeah, I just don't know. Like, I don't know. I don't have space for this and this. Like, I want to. I want to have this. And you were like, "Why don't you just use this room?" And I was like, "That's the dining room. It's gonna have a table in it." And you were like, "Yeah, what happened to you, man?" <laughs> 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 like, 
<laughs> when did you start like having a dining room? <laughs> yeah, That's, that should definitely be your like green screen studio that you step over cables all day. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and like I I believe in that. I really do. If if I didn't have a uh like uh, sort of a family now, I probably would uh, yeah. would would it would also be thinking similarly. Um but I do yeah. I really like having rooms that are rooms, man. This house has been really nice. Yeah, I'm still a little bit stuck in that Midge Hedberg bit where I'm like, you know, screw you real estate lady. This room has an oven in it, or this bedroom has an oven in it. This, be- <laughs> this bedroom has a bunch of people watching TV. That's really awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I I enjoyed the episode, uh, and of course there were a lot of great references in there in the menagerie. Mm-hmm. I love the, the humans are always falling into some menagerie. <laughs> <laughs> Who gets stuck in the menagerie? Um, well, there, there, there was one in the animated series. I mean, there was Pike got stuck in a menagerie. And oh, that's true. The cage. Yeah, no, you're uh, right. The cage, the cage is the one that, <laughs> the one that has that word that I'm thinking of the menagerie. Right. Yeah. Well, there was a two part episode where they like got to reuse that, the pilot's footage yes, called the menagerie. That's the one I'm thinking of. That's what, so that was what was confusing me. Well, here's what, here's what was really confusing me. Why I kept getting confused. This episode is way more reminiscent of the Orville episode where they get stuck in a zoo. There's an Orville oh. episode where they get they get caught by a, a zookeeper and then the Orville has to go get them out of the zoo. <laughs> and it's like very similar to this. There are several of these across Star Trek mm. lore, you know, like Seven being trapped in that menagerie where she has to like go and fight the rock. Yeah. Yeah, oh that's right. Yeah, yeah. You know you know how they you know how they solved it on the Orville? No. They traded them for a display where they could play all of the Orville's files of like real housewives. <laughs> Oh God! <laughs> That's how they solved it. They got their they got their people out, uh, and then it, it it just cut to like a bunch of aliens watching the like uh, whatever people fight on Real Housewives from old Earth Files. <laughs> and you just explained to me once again why I'm not watching that show. <laughs> I love it. Now, if they do an episode later on where they find out that was a horrendous mistake, and they go back and they've modeled their entire culture off of the Real Housewives. <laughs> Maybe I'll be one back over. I would not. I would not put it past him. Uh, that that show that was season one, I believe, and season one was a lot more like I don't know. They would just resolve things with jokes a lot more. The, the later seasons, they've gotten more uh, Star Trek. Yeah, the, much well, much more serious. They're still like have a lot of the same comedy as the Orville, but. Uh, a lot of, it, it, it became like a workplace comedy that exists in like a Star Trekky world. It feels mm. it feels a lot more like The Office or something. That's that kind of comedy instead of like resolving things with a joke. Like they don't turn the ep- It's kind of what I'm talking about with what this is, what the Lower Decks is versus the Orville. Very similar gotcha. in concept, but the Orville does. I think hit on that comedy level, but it still like sometimes makes you uh, ooh. That uh, yeah, but it does. It causes a great shift in tone. Like there's episodes that aren't funny at all, um, and mm-hmm. that's just not what Lower Decks is going for. Lower Decks always wants to make you laugh. Yeah. Oh, uh, but before I forget, uh, I did love because I was like the whole time I'm sitting here thinking like, how is Rutherford going to get a promotion in a day when all the times he saved the ship, he didn't get a promotion, mm-hmm. and then he they like named it. He called it out. He hung the lantern. He's like, "Oh man, it makes me feel silly for having turned down all those promotions all those times." Yeah, <laughs> like he's in his own like just like Mariner. He's in his own state of arrested development because he doesn't want to like lose Tindy, and he feels like he's going to if he gets promoted. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just gonna say right now, they just need to get down because like <laughs> it's been four seasons, y'all. Like. I mean, I'm not, like, really a shipper or anything, but, like, Tindy and Rutherford, man, y'all, it's kind of, come on, y'all dragging this out. <laughs> y'all dragging this out. Uh, yeah, I guess. I don't know. Like, I definitely get that vibe, but I, I ever, it's always hard to know when I get that vibe if it's, like, is this a real thing that should happen, or is this, like, 
a thing that I am thinking right now because I'm so used to not letting two characters of opposite sex be attracted to each other. Like, like I was talking about earlier with, um, or be friends or whatever. Um, uh, Ransom and Mariner, like that one has that because like, I remember they made like a, a an effort to show that they were attracted yeah. to each other. Like, I don't know that they've, have they shown that with Rutherford or they have, they just had like a really nurturing relationship because they definitely feel like they're, they're super close for sure. They're, they're super close. And I would say at least socially codependent it. Oh, fe- for I mean, sure. they're literally giving up promotions to be with each other. It would be neat if they wound up going away with it where it was like, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't remember if they have ever actually like shown either of them to have like an actual sexual desire at any point. Right. But it would be interesting if they did like an asexual relationship, like they're together, but it's not like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, like sure. that, that would be, and that would be an interesting uh, bit of inclusion that would be nice to, to see. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I could, I could definitely see that there, there were two voices that in this, in this, the second episode that I'm like trying to place. Well, the first one was that the uh, Romulan at the beginning of the episode, that the ships get, the ship gets destroyed by that, uh, <laughs> mysterious force that they're clearly setting up as a seasonal arc or whatever. Uh-huh. Uh, what do you think? What do you think will get destroyed next week? What what kind of ship? <laughs> I don't I don't know, man. But the 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 thread that's connecting them is the the lower deckers are essentially planning on uh betraying their captain. That happened both times. Where the Klingons were like, "Yeah, I'm, he won't be captain much longer," and then oh, I they come into contact with that thing. It was both times. There's not that's, that's that cannot be a coincidence. I it's think not. that's I think it's absolutely a coincidence, and I just think it's, I don't. I think it is. Com- it's just them commenting on the uh, way that the ships in Klingon and Romulan lore operate. Like I think that's all. I don't that know. Was. Um, it it was so on the nose. I don't, and it was like the same structure. I I agree. Set up to. I agree. I hear why you'd think that. I just don't agree. I I don't agree that like that's what they're going for. I think that it was just like, hey, aren't Romulans always so treacherous? Wouldn't their lower decks be like this? And then the Klingons were like, aren't Klingons always uh wanting to like kill their commanding officer and take control because that's how their ships work for some reason. <laughs> Well, not always, but yeah. But I, but I hear you. I think that that's a, that's a, that's a fair read. I just didn't, I didn't see it that way. I think they were just trying to, like, make jokes about how those particular ships, kinds of ships, worked. Yeah, but maybe I don't know what that uh, uh, beam or whatever is doing. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I, uh, <laughs> I really loved the <laughs> him being like, "Is this your doing?" He's like, "Let's let's let's dispatch with this." Vessel, so I can get back to being suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a real bummer to see those ships get blown up because, like, we've done we've done this before, where we showed like the I think that I know they showed one where they followed was it a Klingon lower decker and a Romulan lower decker that one season that they did um, a Klingon and Vulcan. Yeah, because that's what I meant. Talin wound up yeah, being yeah. on Sarita. That's what I meant. I don't know why I said Romulan. Um, yeah, so that was really interesting, and I really rooted for those characters. And so, because they're lower deckers, so in this one, like, it really is kind of ratcheting up the tension for me because they're showing me the lower deckers, and then they're letting the ships get destroyed. And I like uh-huh. felt for those lower deckers both times. Like, and I was like, oh man, because um, a lot of times when you just see, I don't know, when you just see like a captain, and then the rest of the crew is just nameless and faceless. Those, those deaths in these kinds of opening scenes where like something gets destroyed and you're like, Ooh, threat. Uh, it's not scary because of that. But in this case, I really, fa- I thought it was effective to show the lower deckers and then have, uh, you know, them respond that way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, man. I think, it would be funny if they were just having those lower deckers be treacherous, <laughs> just so we wouldn't feel bad with them dying. 
Oh, funny. Like, we can't show them for too long because the audience will attach. So we've got to show that they're terrible people for oh, just yeah. a second. It's so interesting how me and you had such different reads on that. Yeah, like I, 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 I thought them being treacherous was just how a Romulan because that's the whole thing about Romulans or whatever that they're always doing. They're kind of making fun of that. Yeah. Um, but it's it's not like it, that's not like it doesn't read completely with with Klingons though because most of the time like. Especially in this era, you see a Klingon, like, they're loyal as shit. And, like, there is, like, loyalty and honor, and loyalty and honor. Well, I think that it's, like, yeah, I, I don't know. It's it's loyalty and honor. Yeah, unless there's a renegade. Well, it, it feels like it's loyalty and honor to the Empire, but not necessarily your superior officers is how I always, like, it seems like they've always got some plot. They're, they're always plotting something. And, I mean, like, yeah, obviously it's problematic to say that that entire race of people is treacherous. <laughs> I don't think that the Klingons are just like treacherous, but they do, they do seem to like want to fight. I don't know. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's interesting that, but they do both start that way though. But would that lead us to think that like there, when this, whenever the Cerritos encounters this thing, that that's going to be going on on our, uh, on the Cerritos, like the, the Federation officers are going to be wanting to, the lower deckers are going to want to, to be somehow, uh, taking over the ship or mutinying. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, I honestly think that they, it is in some way linked that there's a very specific reason they're showing that. And that's how the Cerritos will wind up finding its way because, you know, the, in both episodes, we've dealt with power dynamics and, 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 uh, you know, giving orders, moving up in rank, not being lower deckers anymore. Like, I, I think, I think that is what they're going for. I think they're, hmm. the, whatever this thing is doing, it's like sensing mutiny and coming for them. Interesting. I, that, that, that is interesting. I, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens next week when a Ferengi ship gets encountered. But, see, I feel like it's going to be the same thing. It's going to be, like, if they did this and they have got Ferengis on the bottom decks, but they'd be going, yes, but I am going to get all of the money from this mission when I take out the commander because I want money because that's the stereotype about us. Like, <laughs> Yeah. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah. Uh, do you you want to do some feedback? Because we got some. Yeah, go for it. Uh, Matthew Fox writes in, uh, says, uh, I think this is an old one, uh, but... Um, Matthew Fox. Anyway. Yeah. Finally got caught up on Strange New Worlds, which meant binging your coverage of it. Oh. I loved hearing your perspective on it and wanted to follow up on my favorite episode, Under the Cloak of War. Cool. Like you all, I couldn't help but see Mbinga and Pike in terms of Gar- uh, Garrick and Cisco. I think in some ways what happened in Strange New Worlds actually goes a little, a lot further. Garrick's actions helped save the Federation, possibly the whole quadrant, and Benga acted out of personal motivation. For Sisko, Garrick's actions advanced Sisko's own goals of winning the war. Pike had no stakes in what Mbenga did. No larger uh, could he hang on to to help say, salve his own conscience. Like you all, I think what happened is perfectly in line with both Pike and Mbinga's characters, and while it's hard to justify what Mbinga did, it's also hard to condemn him either. Like the best of Star Trek, it leaves you having to wrestle with the same questions the characters did. Love the coverage. Thanks to you both, Matthew Fox. Hey, thank you, Matthew uh, Fox. Yeah. I'm, I, I, Thanks, I'm assuming Matt. that's the Matthew Fox that we know uh, from uh, yeah, uh, it is. Superhero Ethics and... Um, and uh, Star Wars Universe Podcast. So you check out those podcasts, everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's that's cool. Thanks, Matthew Fox. I completely agree with him. I love that those uh, episodes leave us asking those questions. It's just so good. Yeah, and I, 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 that's my favorite kind of Star Trek. I think. Yeah, me too. Yeah, generally. Which is, you know, I was I was gonna say when I'm thinking about when we were talking about Tuvix earlier, all criticism of Janeway, I think you have to look at it in the in the light of sexism a little bit sometimes. Um, yeah. At least at least the ubiquitous versions of criticism that, that kind of happen. Um, and, you know, I have my issues with Janeway that I, I feel like are divorced from sexism, but who knows? Re, re, reassess my own biases. Um, but I, I think in many ways the Tuvix episode is kind of her pale moonlight. Like, that's why I think that I, I was going to say this earlier, but I think that like 
we all make fun of her for it, but she kind of just makes a really hard decision and she's just like, I can live with this, you know, like it's, it, this is a terrible yeah. thing I'm going to have to do. I realize it's a terrible thing I'm going to have to do, but I'm, I'm going to do it for my friends and I'm going to do it to save my friends. Like, and it's just, it's a rough, rough episode, but it's um, like, yeah. Like we all make fun of her for it, but I, I do think there's not, I mean, obviously there's, it's a little different because that one's for her friends and her, and her fellow officers. Whereas, uh, the threat is a little more existential when it comes to what's going on with Cisco. Yeah. But, uh, I still, I still think there's like, there's an analog there. Um, and I think that this, I'm um, being episode, it's not a bad call to kind of compare this to those episodes because, um, yeah, even it's even more of a personal thing. Because I think that in some ways, as we discussed when we covered the episode, like the continued existence of that ambassador could really help the Federation in their sort of propaganda against the Klingons and like mm. their propaganda for peace with the Klingons, basically. But that's the thing, it's propaganda for peace. You know, he's like really trying to, at this point, he's functionally trying to bring peace to the galaxy, even though it's based on lies. And like, yeah. it's that classic, just such a good question of like the purity of your actions versus the utilitarian outcomes of your, of your actions. It's really, really a wonderful episode. And that isn't like that question, the utilitarian versus that's like a background question to the other stuff that's going on. It's just such a good episode. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it so much. Yep. And we got Stu little. Wow. Uh, says, uh, hello to Vix. I hope the show runs. For 10 seasons, just to see how many ships will be added to the Borg battle part of the intro by then. Did you notice that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it got bigger. but I, It got I bigger. Know. They added the crystalline entity, I think, and maybe that was there before, but they done, they definitely added the giant ship from Star Trek IV that was calling the whales. <laughs> and they, added, they added whale song. <laughs> they were like, well, scream! <laughs> that's amazing no i, I didn't no. Uh, i didn't catch that i just noticed like that looks different but i, I didn't have time to slow it down and look mm. uh Stu says now we've got the whale probe from voyager home from, from voyage home and a few others in there yes mariner janeway did straight up murder two vix this interpretation is canon now it always was right <laughs> oh yeah he says for some reason i relate to this character who is that who is two people in one <laughs> mm. <laughs> Help. Miglimu? And this episode was going so well. You know what? He had one of the best lines. When uh, the primary Tuvix character is, when there's like, yeah, I need, to, I need to talk about this. And he's like, don't do any self-healing until I get there. <laughs> yeah, I loved that. <laughs> I, man, I laughed so hard oh, at that. I, would pretty, I, was, I was mentioning that I was trying to look up some uh, names of this episode. I'm pretty sure the... Uh, Romulan. I keep one. I keep confusing Vulcans and Romulans, which is weird. I never have that problem. Like it's for some reason. Racist. I know. I'm being a real like uh, ear racist. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Vulc. Well, I did it again. Uh, the Romulan at the beginning of the episode uh, was Paul F. Tompkins. I'm not totally sure. He really did a really good job of combining like hiding his voice. He was doing a voice, but like it sounded like Paul F. Tompkins, who's me. me well, he me. does. Yeah, yeah, he does meet with him. And then I think Paul Shearer was possibly the uh, uh, the guy running around with the the lower. The, lo the, the the new yeah. guy, the new guy in his first first away mission in the second episode. Mm. I know Nor Nolan Nor North was in there. I just yeah, I haven't looked it up. Um. Anyway, um, Stu says, "Yeah, kill him, Tillips. Oh wait, hybridizing him so there's less of him works too." <laughs> I don't know about the solution. It ends the immediate crisis, but not the moral dilemma. A proper solution would have been finding a way to bring back Taana and Billups and keep Tillips alive. Tillips reaction is understandable given the precedent set by what happened to Tuvix. So I hardly think they deserve to be uncreated like that. It's also pretty notable how hand waved it gets given the characters were acknowledging how fucked up what happened to Tuvix was earlier. Yeah. But promotions. So whatever. <laughs> well, I think he's basically saying exactly what we said. Yeah, pretty much <laughs> about this whole episode, which is like, if you're gonna bring up this 
really big moral conundrum that is one of the biggest stains on the, like, th- that is treated as one of the biggest stains on the character of a captain. Like, get, you know, uh, it's it's hard to just bring it up and then uh, treat it as only a joke. <laughs> Yeah. For for us fans, that will like want a little bit more examination of that question. Like, was she really right? Like, or was she really wrong? I mean, I don't know. It's uh, it would it's, it would have been interesting to further examine it. I don't think she was wrong, but uh, it was a tough tough situation. I, it's hard. It's re- it, it's just an impossible choice. That's just the whole point. Um, to make us examine our like biases and priors and our like. R- like reasons we believe what we believe, you know, and, and, and it's a really good one because there's really no, there's no good utilitarian answer to that. No, like that's, that's what's tricky. I'm, I, I'm mostly a utilitarian in my ethics. Like I think generally, uh, y- you do what has the best outcomes, but then you have some scenarios where it's like, there's the utilitarian nature is unclear. You can't always know what the right thing thing is going to be you can always know what the outcome of your uh decisions are but also like in this scenario it's like well you either have two vix or you have neelix and tuvok and they all have value and different kinds of value yeah i don't know it's 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 tough <laughs> it's tough it's two against one it's just a numbers game yeah i, I can't that it, you got to, it's a classic trolley problem of like you take action and you kill kill one, or you allow the universe to unfold, and you kill two, and that's yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, because you took the action to kill the one. You know, the others were yeah. they they're dead. They, you know, maybe that just like let them let them die, let them uh, you know, die the way they were always supposed to, or whatever. You know, but that's that really. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's tough. <laughs> Well, as they're not really dead as long as two Vix is alive. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing that that could <laughs> that could have been the uh, resolution of the episode and would have been interesting and different. It, like you know, they're not really dead because they're here. They're part of two Vix, you know. Yeah. But that's not the direction they went. Stu continues. I with I have no bones yet. I must flee. It says of course they give Paul F. Tompkins a character actually worthy of him and the Romulan captain. Oh yeah, that was there. It. You cool. go. And he dies in the cold open. Or does he? Both of these attacks have a follow-up shot of the debris with no bodies, so maybe the mysterious ship's beam also doubles as a transporter. Ooh, good good call. Oh, good call. That's, that's good. That's interesting. Uh, love giving Rutherford a, ri- a rival, given his tendency to like and get along with everyone. <laughs> I, I did like that, yes. Yeah. Uh, Livick! Rutherford! <laughs> and Tindy. <laughs> It's really good. Let me say this. Yeah. Let me say this, though. That line of humans are always falling into into menageries. That could have, that could be foreshadowing for what Stu's talking about. If they actually do are just teleporting these like contentious people and they wind up teleporting everyone from the Cerritos or the, you know, appropriate parties to onto some war world planet or, uh, you know, some sort of menagerie where people have to fight. Or mm-hmm. something, you know? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, we didn't see bodies. That's true. Uh, anyway, Stu says, uh, also love Tucker Tubes and Pico Cochrans. <laughs> 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 also, uh, and then he says, yes, get her ass with your unwavering support, Ransom. Four seasons in, we should probably be done with Mariner's career self-sabotage. No, no. Not, not completely. Yeah, Moopsy ver- Moopsy versus Tribble outbreak. Who would win? Do Tribbles have bones? Ooh, I think they do canonically, don't they? I don't know. They have teeth, or well, the engineered ones do. Yeah, well, I thought the um, I'm trying They're to remember. Uh, the, 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 there's that whole, there's that episode. <laughs> so stupid that I'm canonically thinking about this, but like <laughs> canonically, I they they that short trek. Yeah, that short the trek. Short trek is canon. De- I know that short trek is canon. I know. <laughs> Uh, I think I think in that short trek he goes over like the ratio of of good meat versus like bones or whatever if I remember correctly yeah. and I think they do have bones but it's they're mostly just good eaten. <laughs> yeah, they're really high sources of protein. Uh, 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 
It's so good. <laughs> but you will not decanonize H. John Benjamin from the Star Trek. Oh, universe, no, I wasn't so. trying to decanonize. I just thought it was silly that I was like searching my mind for whether triples have bones. And I was like, oh, yeah, there's a thing that I think addresses that. <laughs> Had to go back and <laughs> had to go back and actually listen to what they say. Uh, ooh, Stu getting dicey with this one. Wait, I can just ask for stuff I deserve. The WGA motto. Sure. You, you yeah, can. I mean, yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I think you say you say uh, dicey, but I think I can't tell if he's like. Uh, it, it, yeah, I can't tell if it's sarcastic or no. I, I, th- I think that's like that's true. Rutherford's right, and like that really is what unionization is. It's like are like fighting for your uh, uh, your your labor rights and like what you want. It's like oh yeah, we can we have power to say what we're worth, and I think that's super cool. Yeah. Uh, Stu continues fun double to start the season, and the promotions should, should really, yeah, should hopefully lead to some new avenues for storytelling. We'll see what's going on with that mysterious ship. Do you think it's a new thing or part of the other Boimler Section Thirty One thing? Ooh, mm. I can't imagine they'll just leave Section Thirty One out of the season, right? What? But because Boimler uh, was created in season two. He came back to to be dead in season three, and then section thirty one eyes. I do feel like they will definitely pick up that thread and at least have an episode that addresses it. I don't see why this ship would be connected to that, um, unless it's a Starfleet vessel that's like undermining the other em- empires or whatever. But yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't see why it would. There's nothing, nothing in that opening sequence that makes me think. Ah, that's a that's definitely a Boimler. <laughs> yeah. Uh, by the way, I just realized those Tucker tubes are probably named after Trip. Yeah, 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 it, uh, yeah, for sure. It didn't. Yeah, it didn't it didn't click with me. Oh yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Until just now, I was like, wait, I know Tucker. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was really great. Yeah. Uh, that's it. That's all we got, man. All right. Well, uh, man. Do you feel good about leaving this one? Yeah, I do. I feel good. Um, we, we did not know they were dropping two. So we, 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 yeah. we both have watched two episodes, which was a lot longer and we've recorded a lot longer than expected. So, um, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll let you guys go, but, uh, I'm excited that Lower Decks is back and I'm excited to do more Star Trek universe podcast, bud. I've been doing it the whole time. Yeah, I, I know it. I know it. And I'm, uh. I I I've I've missed it, but I've also had an insane time lately. So, yeah. Whew. All right, man. We'll uh, we'll uh, talk to you guys soon. Joel on true. Live long and prosper. Moopsie. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or Maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 